So um, uh, we've had one fantastic presentation now, haven't we, everyone? Our next um, speaker is Dr. Catherine Conan from the USA. Um, Dr. Conan is a Forensic Molecular Biology Assistant Professor, Undergraduate Program Director at the Department of Forensic Sciences in uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. And Dr. Conan has kindly um, said um, that they will present today um, their virtual serology laboratory. So it looks absolutely brilliant, but highly recommended to us. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Conan. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to go ahead and share this here. So this was, you know, something that I developed in light of COVID last year. And I think that we're all well aware of a lot of the challenges that we are facing with basically just things being unknown. So last summer, we did not know what the fall semester was going to look like for 2020. We did not know if we were going to have classes in person or if they were going to be virtual again. And I was really struggling with what I was going to do with my forensic serology lab. So I decided to take the time over the summer to attempt to do what I could to put together a virtual lab because it was really up in the air. But I really wanted to make sure that whatever I came up with had a good amount of rigor and still kept student interest because I was competing with what would normally be an in-person lab. The other problem that I had was I had very scarce resources. I do not have any type of um, experience putting together virtual labs. The resources we had at Virginia Commonwealth University were being spread very thin because other courses were attempting to go virtual. And so we just were just all strapped very, very thin. And again, it was I had limited time, right? So I'm working over the summer trying to figure out what I can do for the fall to get ready for that. So I decided that I would just even see if it was possible, right? Can I put together a virtual lab for forensic serology um, and in an attempt to not completely reinvent the wheel, I wanted to work with my existing laboratory manual that I developed for forensic serology course that has a variety of different serological tests for different body fluids. So blood, semen, saliva, urine, and feces. And in this lab manual, I've got a mixture of presumptive and confirmatory tests. Some of them are historical to give the students that historical perspective of where we're coming from, but also combined with some more current techniques. And then again, because I don't have a lot of resources, um, I started to see if I could use something that I already knew, which was Microsoft PowerPoint, which is in and of itself probably not the best platform to use, but I didn't have time to go learn a new platform. And so I thought I would just dabble in what I knew, which again was PowerPoint. So I literally just started playing around with PowerPoint over the summer. Um, I attempted to create lab equipment and supplies that were as realistic as possible. And it was funny because I was literally taking simple shapes circles and squares, triangles and rectangles, and combining them together, add a, adding shadowing, adding 3D formatting, to create something that looked as real as I could. And I also had some real images, but they were few and far between. So some of the real images I had were the centrifuge and these micro pipettes. I just had images from online and then I used a filter to remove the background and then inserted those into the um, Microsoft PowerPoint virtual lab. But then everything else you see, the scissors, the forceps, the vortex, uh, these swabs, everything else I created using those simple shapes and adding three-dimensional formatting, formatting and shadowing. So after I got something that was looking fairly realistic, I, I then wanted to see, well, can I get these objects and these supplies to move in a realistic way? So I would apply a variety of animations. I was using rotating objects, lots and lots of motion paths. I learned about triggered animations. So you can start an animation simply by clicking on a particular item. So that would, again, start an animation 
you know, if a student needed to use a particular item, they would click on it and it would start that animation. Uh, I learned about timed animations so I could delay an animation from occurring until a specific time. And in the end, almost every single object had multiple animations associated with it to make this laboratory as realistic as possible. The other thing that I found was very important was that placement of the objects after they were done were extremely important. So as I move from one animation to the next, I needed to make sure an item was put down precisely where it was before so that it would appear as realistic as possible. In the end, what ended up happening was that this was a huge consumption of my time. So I was spending about 40 hours trying to develop a single um, lab exercise. So it was a huge, huge time constraint on me to get these labs developed. Um, and after starting with the easier labs, with just positive and negative controls, again, to see how feasible it is this, I would do some self-checking, I would troubleshoot, I would revise, and then I went ahead and I worked on all of the blood lab exercises. So in my forensic serology lab manual, we do five different blood lab exercises, which I've got listed here. And I wanted to make sure, or my next step again was to develop all five of those. But because of the amount of time that I spent developing those, I only developed them for four samples and controls. In a normal in-person lab setting, we would have had 15 or 20 samples that the students would be tackling in those in-person labs, but I just didn't have the time to do that over the summer. And again, if I spent too much time building out everything, it would be that much harder to revise. So after I built out those five lab exercises, I got student feedback and I was able to get feedback from both undergraduate and graduate students. Students that were specifically in a forensic biology concentration versus those that were in another forensic science concentration that was not biology. And then also those that were enrolled in forensic serology lecture and lab versus those that were just enrolled in the lecture only. And after I was able to get feedback from those students, I incorporated some changes, made some revisions, um, and I'm still working on creating some remaining, those remaining samples that we would normally cover in the entire, or in the in-person um, lab exercise. But I'm actually holding on that because one of the feed, one of the items of feedback that I got from um, instructors and others that are interested in it is that they didn't necessarily want the students to process all 15 to 20 of those samples. They really felt it was good literally to have a positive and a negative control, and it would be a great supplement to an in-person lab. Um, it could work as a review. It could be supplement, or I already said supplement. Um, it could be introductory so they could see how it worked before they did the in-person, and then it would also be a great training module. So again, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence about building out all those other samples because there may not necessarily be a need for it. So after working on the blood labs, I then tackled the semen labs and I had uh, four different semen labs that I was working on for the virtual lab. I have created the last three. I held off on the um, ALS and the UV screening just because that one was fairly challenging. And again, based upon some feedback that I'd gotten from those that were interested in using it, they wanted to save that more for an in-person exercise as opposed to a virtual. I have not yet gotten student feedback. That's going to be one of my upcoming steps. And then after I get that student feedback, I'll incorporate their feedback and make some additional revisions. All right, so what challenges did I face? So when I was building out and developing these virtual labs, I knew how to proceed in the um, procedures because I was familiar, I'm familiar with all the protocols. I've written the SOPs in the lab manual. I'm creating the PowerPoint so I know where they need to click and when they need to click. But how would the students know? So it was very, very important that the students 
make sure that I would make sure that the students were relying on their lab manual as they went through the virtual lab. So they would still be working from a standard operating procedure um, in the lab manual and they would know what steps are coming next. But sometimes it would be difficult um, for them to know for a particular step where they needed to click. And so I would introduce prompts to let them know that they needed to proceed in a particular fashion just to keep the virtual lab moving. And also I was able to maintain engagement with the students by incorporating some questions. So if a particular step is having them add a particular volume of a reagent, I will ask them, what volume are you using? Just so to make sure that they're reading in their uh, standard, in their SOP, and then also ask them what tool they would use for that. So what pipette what would they use? How would um, the pipette be set? Just other types of questions like that to help make sure that they are paying attention to those things and learning those things as they would if they were actually doing it in person. Other challenges that I faced were that these PowerPoints were becoming so large because of the number of animations that I had. And at one point, I think one of my lab exercises, I was approaching 50 plus slides and I had animations on every single one. And so it was slowing them down. And what I decided to do was to create smaller PowerPoint files by having one file per exercise per sample. And then I embedded hyperlinks within the PowerPoint so that it would point to other files that it needed to go to as the student progressed through the virtual lab. What this ended up doing in return was creating lots and lots of PowerPoint files. And so it, again, as students are coming into this, if they see 50, 70 different files, they're not really sure which ones to click on, where they need to go. So I ended up making all those files hidden except for the main file that I wanted them to be using. Um, as far as keeping the work or their virtual lab flowing appropriately and not getting hung up um, and also to prevent tampering, I needed to figure out a way to have that main PowerPoint file protected so that as they opened it, they couldn't accidentally click on something, accidentally change something. And so I found out that you can actually save a PowerPoint file in slideshow mode, which was wonderful. So they can click on this file, it opens up, it's automatically in slideshow mode, and they simply go through the virtual lab. It's going to connect to the different files that it needs to access. And the students don't see any of this going on behind the scenes, which is wonderful. Now I had to, or the next thing I had to do was figure out how am my students going to get this, right? I have roughly, you know, at one point it was 70 plus files. How do I get them all of these files? And literally all I had to do was create a zip file that contained all of the necessary files. I posted that zip file on my uh, course site so we, I've used Blackboard in the past and we switched over to Canvas this academic year and it worked the same way on both and all the students had to do was download that zip file to their computer. Very very important instruction that some of the students missed was that they must extract the files from the compressed zip file. If they didn't extract it then it didn't work appropriately. But extracting the files is fairly simple. You literally just click, um, do a, you know, right click to bring up that menu to extract the files. So I wanted to go ahead and demo some of the virtual labs for you. And I'm not sure exactly how much time we'll have, but some of these are longer than others. Let me open up um, what it would look like after the students have extracted the, the download folder. They're going to have some protocols, um, some instructions, and then this is the single virtual serology lab file that they need, and the instructions specifically indicate that this is the file that they'll click on. So we can go ahead and click on that to open it. It brings up to the welcome page or the opening page. Um, again, because this is focusing on blood and semen for now, I haven't built out the saliva, urine, or feces. I just have the test here 
for blood and semen. So this is just kind of letting them know what tests we have. This is a welcome page that introduces them to their virtual bench top. So anything that they click on is going to the software, the virtual lab is going to say what it is and what it's used for. And so the students can spend time clicking on various items. You know, we, we don't necessarily know how much laboratory experience students have had in the past and if they've been exposed to all these different um, pieces of equipment. And then down here, th this is really fun. I'm very proud of these. These are the drawers that have some additional accessories like a calculator, a timer, and a marker. And then over here, we've got a digital camera and some safety glasses. So again, they can spend as much time as they want um, looking at the different uh, items of equipment here, but when they're ready, they can click on the Get Started button up top. And just like we would in a real in-person lab, they're going to get started by putting on their personal protective equipment, lab coat, gloves, mask, and safety glasses. And then next, again, just like we would in person, they're going to disinfect their desktop or their bench top. So we'll start with 10% bleach and then wipe that up with a paper towel and then come back after that with 70% ethanol. And at this point, I'm not touching my computer at all. I clicked on the disinfect button and the software, if you want to call it software, the virtual lab is doing all this for the student. So not only is a student going through the motions, but they're also learning, right? So the software, the virtual lab is teaching them how we should disinfect our desktop or our bench top. After they've got their PPE on and they've got their bench top clean, they can go ahead and select their test. So again, I've got a variety of different blood tests and semen tests. Some of the, like I said, some of these are longer than others and some of them are fairly short. Um, I think what I'll do is start with a PTMB, which is a combined phenolphthalein tetramethylbenzidine presumptive test for blood. And for this one, what we typically do in the lab is have these pieces of filter paper, and that's just going to be their small workspace for their individual samples. So again, I haven't touched anything. I just click the start button essentially. And again, this is teaching them to make sure that they label everything. One thing that often comes up is that students um, don't label and they get their samples mixed up. So we need to make sure they're labeling. And at, if they are going along with their lab manual, they're going to see that for the positive control or any sample that we're using, we need to have a particular size cutting. So in their lab manual, they'll see that they need a two by two cutting. If they accidentally click the wrong one, it's going to say, oops, check your protocol, uh, just to make sure that they are following along correctly. And then we'll use some scissors to cut that neat blood undiluted blood, put it on our filter paper. And then again, this is a, a teaching step. So they need to make sure that they are cleaning their utensils with bleach and ethanol after using them to prevent future contamination of other samples. The negative control in this particular case doesn't need anything else. There's no substrate that we're using other than the filter paper itself. So once those utensils are clean, the next step is to go ahead and start applying the reagents. So we'll start with our distilled water. And again, we're going to apply a drop to each of the samples. And let's say the student gets distracted or something, whether in person or virtually. This just helps them keep track of what reagents have been added. So next I'll move on to our ethanol. And the order of these reagents are very important. Uh, this particular presumptive test is set up to have these added in a particular order to prevent some false positives. So if by chance they happen to click on the wrong item or the wrong reagent, it's going to say, oops, check your protocol, give that error message. And then we'll move on to our, and at this point, we shouldn't have had any color changes, right? So we're looking for a particular color change um, if we have a, a positive blood sample. 
but we shouldn't have any color changes until we add our hydrogen peroxide, at which point anything with blood should have a pink color change. And that's because the phenolphthalein reagent that we are using is being reduced and I'm sorry, was reduced. And then when we add the hydrogen peroxide, it's in its oxidized form. And so we get this color change where it turns pink. And then when we add our tetramethylbenzidine, we're going to see a subsequent color change to a, a tealish green color. And again, we'll only see those color changes if the sample does indeed have blood in it. So once those are done, it will say testing complete. It will remind the students to record their results and to clean their bench top with bleach and ethanol, and also just kind of clean up their, their space. So this was, is definitely one of these shorter protocols. Um, it only takes a few minutes to go through the controls. Uh, with the first iteration of this, I did have a variety of other samples, but again, based upon feedback for how instructors were planning on using this, it didn't really seem necessary to have all of those different um, samples available to them. So at this point, we can go back to the serological tests and pick additional tests that we could perform. But I think for the sake of time, um, I can move on and, and finish up with the rest of my presentation. And at any point, there's a built-in escape. You can press the escape button at any time when the student wants to exit. And that will close out those um, PowerPoints. All right, so back to some of the feedback that I got from the students. I did ask for feedback from 43 students that were enrolled in forensic serology course in the fall of 2020. And about half of those were undergraduate students and about half of them were graduate students. And again, some of them were enrolled in just a forensic serology lecture, whereas others were enrolled in both a lecture and a lab. And then I asked them to rate how effective the virtual lab was anywhere from highly effective to highly ineffective with respect to five different learning outcomes that I'll show you on the next slide. I did get responses from 26 students. The majority of those were graduate students, about 62%, and then 38% were from undergrads. And 11 of those that provided feedback were only enrolled in the lecture portion of serology and not also the corresponding lab. So overall, 85 to 96 percent of the students rated or uh, the virtual lab as being highly effective here in blue or effective in green for each of the five learning outcomes that I had for uh, the particular virtual lab. So how well did they understand the forensic blood analysis process? How well did they understand the procedures? Um, how well did they understand precautions relating to contamination prevention, as well as processing controls, and then also the use of following a standard operating procedure. So it was amazing that just from this virtual lab, there were so many students, 85 to 96 percent of the students felt that the virtual lab was effective to highly effective for each of these five different outcomes. And then 22 of the students left open-ended comments. I really liked that uh, a lot of the students said it was very similar to or exactly like the in-person lab, which was great. That's exactly what I was aiming for because we weren't exactly sure what the fall semester was going to look like. I think I kind of skipped over that and I, I'm sorry about, sorry about that, but what ended up happening in the fall was we were able to have in-person labs. So I decided to still, um, asked for their feedback on the virtual labs and it was voluntary for them to participate in the virtual labs but then also provide their feedback on how it compared to the in-person lab and what if they had only had the virtual lab and so again it was very very informative to get their feedback 41 percent of the students left entirely positive comments 45 percent left a mix of positive comments technical issues they encountered and or other things that they didn't particularly like about the virtual lab and then 14% of the comments were on technical issues only. So overall, I had 86% of the students that left one or more positive remarks, which was great. And they used these keywords like amazing and awesome and fun, 
but also that it was very informative and it was beneficial. Some of the criticisms that I got and technical issues uh, from the students was that the, the virtual lab was slow or that there are too many files or that it didn't advance correctly or that the mouse was disappearing. One student was having this problem with the mouse, but it, I wasn't able to recreate it with any other student. The majority of these, the first three, were mostly attributed to students not extracting the zip file as instructed. And so if those, once the, the zip file is downloaded, if it's not extracted, it will not work correctly. That's definitely a, a major problem. Um, another thing, oh, actually the too many files issue had to do with whether or not the students had the hidden files showing, which they would actually have to go in and have that setting set on their computer to see hidden files. Or if they were a Mac user, Mac users are going to see all files regardless of if they're hidden or not. So that was definitely a problem um, for Mac users. But again, in the instructions, it tells them which file to look for. So if they look for that particular file that's going to be in slideshow mode only, then that shouldn't have been a problem. Some of the Mac users also had some other issues like it being slow or not advancing correctly, but it wasn't all Mac users. So some Mac users had absolutely no problems, whereas others did. I wasn't able to find any users of Windows operating system um, that had any problem with the um, virtual lab itself. So in conclusion, the virtual forensic serology lab was a very effective tool for the five learning outcomes that I have shown here. Um, it worked very well for students, regardless of if they were in the lecture only or if they were in lecture and lab for forensic serology. I didn't really see much of a difference in the feedback between grad and grad and undergraduate students. And also, it, I didn't see much of a difference in the feedback between those that were in the forensic biology concentration versus forensic science students that were in non forensic biology concentrations. They also left comments that it was useful as a review tool and to study. And other feedback that I've gotten um, was that it could be a great training module. So moving forward, I do want to get some feedback on the semen labs that I've built out and see how the students um, think those are working. And then once I get those feedback, incorporate their revisions. And again, I'm questioning, do I build this out to more than just a positive and negative control? Do I include a variety of other samples or do I leave it as a basic module with just a positive and negative control? and then also start working on the saliva, urine, and feces labs. If you're interested in some additional information, I did have a, a journal article published last December in the Journal of Forensic Science Education, and it was mostly talking about having a virtual classroom in the COVID pandemic, and so only part of it was dealing with the forensic serology lab, virtual lab, but again, there are some other things in there as well. And if you have any other questions or information, you can contact me. My email's down here, cmconnon at vcu.edu. And a special thank you to Tom Woodward at the VCU Alt Lab. He did provide a lot of support with some of the um, hyperlinking issues and the, the file types that I was working with in PowerPoint. And also a big thank you to my students and my teaching assistants for trying out my virtual labs and providing some very valuable feedback. Wow, Kathy, that is amazing. Mm -hmm. The amount of time you must have put into that. I mean, I know you said like 40 hours per one is, is phenomenal. I really hope your students know how much time and effort <laughs> you put into this. <laughs> but yes. it certainly certainly looks like it you know from from our our side of things and our perspective um so you know if people do have questions for Kathy um please pop them in the chat um I mean or or put your hand up and and you can ask them audibly that's absolutely fine too um so I mean firstly I was wondering whether you'd shared any of these um I know you were talking about sharing them within your institution but um, I was wondering whether as an example, because I wouldn't, I, I mean, I know how to move animations around, but I wouldn't have a clue about 
how to do all of the, the tasks that you've done and whether kind of just one of the short examples could be um, a resource that people could download to, to get them started with how they could do it. But, you know, obviously, I'm not sure if that's something that you would be able to do. You mean as far as sharing how to develop it? Yeah, like um, so that there was one yeah. that you, you could download the zip file so you could see how the animations worked and how um, so that then you could set up your own version. Yes. Yeah, so I can, let me see if I can share this again. I can show you kind of what some of those animations look like. Yeah, that's share. Um, let's see, we looked at the PTMB. So you have if you go in, you have to have the animation showing the animation pane. And I mean, there's just this is one slide, the yeah. number of animations on the very first slide. So, yes, someone could go through and kind of see the the animation tools that I'm using. So this is um, if it's green, it's something that's appearing. If it's red, it's something that's going away. If there's a line here, it's a motion path. Um, these are kind of the timing of it. The the triggers here mean what am I clicking on to get it to to force that animation to go. So this, just developing it like would be a whole course in and of itself, like how to use PowerPoint to do these types of things. But yes, it, it was very challenging, but it was also very fun. So, I, you know, I, I do like doing things like this, but if I had to do this during um, like a regular semester, there just would not have been time to do it. Absolutely. We've got a great question about whether you thought um, or used the uh, approach for practitioner training. So I have been approached for that. You know, I've had some groups reach out to me about training for practitioners, but nothing has ever really panned out. I think I'm at one point I was OK with sharing the files because as complex as they were, if someone really wanted to attempt to recreate them, they could. They're not secure at this point. Um, so when I have shared them, they get everything. And so I'm a little bit uneasy about that, but I would like to get to that point and I do need to work with my institution's um, commercialization group to see what kind of protection I can have on there and how we can get this out for practitioner training. Yeah, that would be brilliant. Yeah, there's loads of positive comments coming through about how innovative and creative it is. And, you know, uh, it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, I, what now that you're back on campus, how and, and the students are obviously given the opportunity to, to do them voluntarily, how many of them are taking up kind of doing these classes um, as, as preparation work or as revision. Have you been able to track that at all? Yes, so this semester it was, I for my forensic serology course, it was completely optional if they wanted to use them and not many use them, which was kind of sad. Um, I think maybe if I demoed them in class and showed them what it looked like, then they might be more inclined and more excited about it. Just the front end of our semester is so busy. Um, I would really have to just, I only, I also only teach the course once a year. So I have to remind myself next fall, I need to show them this during class to get them excited about it so they can start looking at it and playing with it. Because if I don't, I just really don't think that they're going to take the time. Yeah, definitely. Or having um, like a, a quiz check at the start of the next class to see mm -hmm. have they actually done it to maybe give them an incentive to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we've I think we've been finding very similarly, you know, in, in our um, anything that we've we've used in a virtual lab and then we've used it as prep work. It, mm -hmm. Those that are really engaged and really, um, you know, try everything to increase their learning. Um, they do absolutely participate, but then there's obviously those that have other responsibilities outside of class that unfortunately then don't take up those those amazing opportunities. Mm -hmm. 
is there anything you'd kind of if if um you were thinking about doing this in another another discipline like forensic chemistry is there any what would be your key tip or piece of advice to either your colleagues or um to anyone considering using powerpoint in this way i would say start slow right so work out as many kinks as you can before because there were so many files that if I even made a small change, I had to make that same change in maybe 20 or 30 files. And so you just you really need to start slow and also try to um, use what you've already done as much as you can. So I was trying to utilize the same animations when I would go from you know, one step to the next. And so I would basically like duplicate the slide and then try to kind of delete what I didn't need from that, but keep the base there that I needed of the animation that I wanted to repeat. But it's, I would just say start slow, try to work out as many kinks as you can and go from there and get feedback early, right? Because if you get feedback too late and you've built out too many things and you've got too many types of things to change, then it, it becomes very cumbersome. The, I wish that there is some way that I could create an object in Microsoft and say, here is this object, and these are the animations that I want to kind of access, regardless of what slide I'm on. I wish that there is a way to do that, and there might be, I just don't know how, instead of having to recreate or copy the object from one slide to the next. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, loads of people saying, you know, what brilliant um, and uh, intense commitment from both, you know, yourself and Joe with all the, the time and effort that you, you put into the work and the students and everything. Um, I mean, thank you so much as well for, you know, volunteering to to share your, your experiences and also obviously the link to your um, uh, your article as well. I'm sure people would be really interested in that. I mean, on our lecture remotely site, we can always put a link directly to the article if you know that would help um, sort of viewers, um, but also yourself in terms of in increasing the the readership of the article as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and David was mentioning that you know these things we used to use flash for and obviously that doesn't exist anymore um so it's great to know that there's a tool that we all know and we're very familiar with in terms of you know powerpoint but the way in which we can be really creative uh, in actually using it um and uh yeah he was mentioning that in flash you could edit the objects etc which is a lot more difficult um in in this 